It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Good Monday morning. Welcome back to the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. More importantly, welcome back to college basketball. It begins tonight. Number six, Gonzaga. Number eight, Baylor in the Spokane Arena. A little late night uh, with the Zags. Probably tip off 8.30, 8.45-ish after Monday night football. Uh, and we're we're glad to be back with you. Jim Meehan, the Spokesman Review, covered the Zags for forever, uh, since at least dose seven-ish full-time. Uh, Richard Fox, my sidekick, uh, the baritone voice on SWX, on KHQ for Gonzaga Basketball Telecast. How many years is us uh, for us, Foxy? What are we on here? Well, I mean, yeah, it was, and I think if you want to throw in the the uh, years we did it with uh, Blanchett, I mean, we've been doing some version of this for a long time. But yeah, it's it's uh, we we've made a pretty good run of it. Yeah, if you can't tell, we enjoy it, and uh, we enjoy bringing it to you every Monday. We tape every Monday morning, and you can find us everywhere at the Spokesman Review, which is spokesman dot com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google. Spreaker, we're out there. So come by, check us out every Monday. We'll keep you up to date on everything Zag related. Uh, Foxy, did you off season well? How'd you do? We did well, buddy. We it's uh, first summer we haven't traveled as a family um, in quite a while. Kind of just wanted to stay home, and so you know we didn't do a whole lot. It wasn't nearly as exciting as the previous summers, but uh, you know it was kind of nice to have it take a year off. I'm sure we'll travel quite a bit, quite a bit again next year. But you know we're in the thick of it, as you remember with your kids. Uh, I've got three basketball practices a week, two games a week, the GU stuff, and then you know uh, my 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 real job. So it's uh, we're going a million miles an hour, but uh, trying to enjoy it uh, as much as we can. Do they call you coach? Uh, most of the kids do. Um, <laughs> uh, I get a lot of Mr. Coach or Mr. Fox, which I think is just hilarious and makes me feel really old. But Do we, you know. do we need to expand the podcast to, to cover your youth basketball games? You know, preview the games, go through the coaching strategies, pick them up. You know, it's, uh, the coaching strategy is pretty um, – in the moment, uh, we don't do any scouting of the other team. You know, it's about us, Jim. Okay, if we take care of what we need to take care of, uh, it's you know, it's just funny being in that position. But I love it. I mean, I absolutely love coaching the kids, and um, you know, there's a lot of their you know, our kids go to Cataldo, so we were able to keep a lot of those kids together, which is a ton of fun. And yeah, how about you? How was your summer? My summer was good. My fall wasn't quite as good. Had a little surgery. We don't mm. have to talk about that, but uh, bouncing back and and uh, and doing well and ready for the hoop season. My wife and I did coached our kids forever, and uh, my wife way better coach than I am because she has that magical word patience. I I don't. Uh, so I don't know how my kids would review our coaching. They probably love mom, and dad was a little iffy. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, before we get rolling, take a look at this. The Spokesman Interviews College Basketball section. Nice. I think there's only nine or ten pages on Gonzaga's basketball team in there. It uh, <laughs> covered everything. The returning guys, why they came back, the newcomers. I talked to Caleb Battle. He is a character. He is going to be a fun guy to cover, fun guy to watch. Did the McCarthy's 20-year anniversary with 20 moments milestones all those things it's all in there so pick up a copy it was in sunday's review and uh foxy i don't think anything really happened in the off season with gonzaga uh, well i mean Pewey, mark few was uh won a gold medal with usa basketball there was that and then there was basically every scholarship guy deciding to come back in this day and age of transfer portals and nil I think four starters, six of the seven uh, leading scores back. Added uh, the aforementioned Caleb Battle. Added Michael Ajayi, 
uh, from Pepperdine, two guys who are going to play a ton, added some pieces for the future. Uh, what else? Oh, joined the Pac-12. That happened. Um, and then ranked number six in the preseason poll. Other than that, did you Pretty notice, any, did you notice anything? Nothing? <laughs> well, good question is, where do you want to start, brother? <laughs> Let's start with that roster. We'll get to all, all right. that. Uh, all that, but we'll start with that roster. Uh, it's just very rare at any program when you have guys that are accomplished <clears throat> as, uh, you know, kind of that core group, uh, six guys, what they did last year, who could probably name a school on the West Coast or the Big 12 or whatever, mm -hmm. and, uh, and sign for uh, significant NIL money, not that they're not being uh, uh, compensated well at Gonzaga because obviously I think they're pretty competitive. That shows through all this. Uh, but for them all to come back to all kind of talk about, we think we can do better than we did. We think uh, we've got guys in that locker room that that I, we want to be with. Uh, that's impressive in this day and age. What What are your thoughts on on uh, the climate and what the Zags were able to do in the off season? Well, I, I it's it's impressive going back 10, 15, 20 years, but to your point, with the NIL being what it is in, uh, in today's college athletics, I think it's even more remarkable. And, it, it, and there wasn't a lot of questions. It wasn't as if they had to wait a prolonged period of time. I think pretty, you know, in today's day and age, almost immediately or, or about as quick as you can, you know, they got firm commitments from these guys that they want to come back. And from a roster building perspective, you know, I presume it was probably one of the least stressful off seasons the staff has had, just knowing the continuity, continuity, continuity they're going to maintain. Um, and now we're not trying to rebuild the roster, but we're trying to fill in some gaps in, in our rotations or, you know, in the player type that we have. So they've done, a, you know, we keep saying it and it's, but it keeps being true. Uh, Mark and his staff have done, just continue to do a remarkable job. Um, with the roster, uh, maintaining, uh, you know, keeping guys around. I think of a guy like Ben Gregg, who's, you know, last year really blossomed the second half of the year, but, you know, I don't think, you know, had the smoothest ride up to that point. He's still here. Dusty Stromer, you know, rough, rough freshman year, had some great moments, but certainly lost his starting spot to Ben, um, but stayed it, stayed with it, is coming back. I think they, they do a really good job of communicating with their players throughout the course of the year. Um, and they develop guys. And I think, you know, players see that, appreciate that. And, you know, when you can bring back not only, um, you know, forget about just the level of talent that they have, but when you can bring back a core like that and then the complementary pieces that they brought in that fit, you I mean, you're starting the season on second base. I mean, you're, you're not, the ramp up is totally different than it would be for that. It, like it is for a lot of programs where every year we've got five, six, eight, nine new players that we're trying to incorporate and yeah. Zaga doesn't have that challenge this year at all. No. And, and they had a real rare luxury with all those guys coming back with pretty much every position covered back to some degree, unfortunately lost steel venters for the second straight year with the uh, season ending <laughs> injury, uh, but still have some pieces there added Khalif battle added a who can play three, four, that mix there uh you know they were able to their second half of the transfer portal season they were able to get guys that i think will help this year emmanuel in will be a will be a, a a contributor a very good defensive player uh braden smith uh player of the of the year in his conference back east has uh has scheduled a red shirt he probably will be handed the keys the, the next year to run things he's got two years in in college starts mm -hmm. score distribute uh and then a big kid uh ismaili uh ismaili i guess it is uh, he's, he's seven foot and uh, he looks the part he just needs time to develop and such all those pieces are not not totally for this year they're for down the road because they're going to lose six or seven guys from this mm -hmm. team depends mm -hmm. on what Steele does I mean, they got seniors. Uh, they're old. This is an old team, and it's an old team in the Gonzaga uniform. It's not necessarily right. an old team. And, you know, we brought in five transfers with 100 games in their backgrounds. Now, they did bring in a couple of guys who played a ton with uh, 
Battle and and Michael from Pepperdine, but uh, they built for the future uh, mm-hmm. as well as as the present. So that roster, the first thing that jumps out to me is, and they did it against USC. They started big, Ben, Michael, and uh, Graham Ek in the middle, and uh, you know had Battle at six five, one ninety, mm-hmm. solid physical kid. And then as the game wore on, they tried every combination on demand. There was true experimentation going on there, which you do in exhibition games. But the last 10 minutes or so, it got a little more serious. The game was on the line. They went small. Uh, I mean, they can throw a three-point shooting lineup out there. They can throw a more defensive-minded lineup out there within a chin tank. Uh, you know, they can go big like they did last year when when Ben Gregg started. Um uh, this uh, the depth there. How how deep they will go in the rotation? Mark is usually in the seven and a half to eight range. I can see him pushing that to at least eight and probably nine, with maybe Emmanuel being being that ninth guy. I got four bigs. I got four guards right out of the shoot that are. I think you know Dusty is going to play. Uh, you know Huff is seriously going to play. Um, you got the two senior guards. So how deep do you think they'll go? And how do you like, what do you like about the composition of this? What do you think it allows them to do with this roster? Well, I mean, to answer your second question about what I I like about the composition, it's a balanced roster. That was a real challenge last year. They were very big, big forward. You know, the, 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 the front line was clearly where they had a lot of depth and, and were strongest despite how well Hickman and Nemhart played, um, particularly down the stretch of last season, they've got real balance this year. I mean, they, you know, let's, we could talk about Emmanuel and, and I, I think he's going to be, able, he's got a chance to carve out a role this year, which should be interesting. But if you presume that maybe he's, you know, a guy for next year, they've got a solid eight guys, four on the perimeter, four inside that provides them with a lot of flexibility, but, you know, getting ready for, you know, our podcast today, I was, you know, trying to list, you know, what's the strengths of this group and what, you know, what are some of the weaknesses that I listed depth on, on both sides of the ledger, because it's, it's difficult to balance depth, particularly in college where, you know, the, the season can feel long. Yeah. Especially for, you know, when you and I, you and I covering them, it can certainly start dragging. And when you get in February and you're, and you're starting to look forward to March, but you know, this isn't an NBA season where you've got 82 games. And that depth is not only you need it, but everyone, you know, all those guys are going to have opportunities to play. You know, how are they going to manage that is a real question for me. Um, it's a luxury. Mark has never been one to go deep. Um, I, I, they've had other teams in the past that have had this type of depth, quality depth. Yeah. But inevitably, he's down, come March, he's down to seven. Um, which means you're going to have one or two guys that are kind of left out of the mix, but that's probably, that's a problem for another day. You know, at the end, you know ultimately these guys are going to be the ones who determine who, if, if that's where it ends up, where that, you know, the rotation is cut down, you know, all these guys are going to have a pretty big say on whether or not they're going to be in that part of the rotation. So, yeah. you know, but I, 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 I agree with you, you know, it, it's, it's a luxury to, to, you can go big, you can go small, you can, you can be put a defensive minded group out there. You can put a, a group out there that can shoot it from all five spots, which is you know pretty, pretty rare at the college level. Um, you know, but on the flip side too, Jim, you know, another question that, that I have is what's the identity of this group? And every team is going to f- need some time to figure out what that, the answer to that question is. But sometimes when you have that much flexibility, it can be hard to nail down or to land on what that identity is going to be. So I, I, that's what I'm going to be most interested in here, interested in watching here this first month of the season. It's going to take, I think, this staff some time to figure out kind of what the rotations might look like moving forward. Um, you know, presumably nobody gets hurt. Um, you know, they're, they're going to need some runway to do that. And then what is this team's identity? You know, last year they played hard. They were really good on the glass, um, and they kind of just beat people up in league. I mean, at least that's how it felt. Yeah. Um, they, they, their size made it, you know, was really problematic, even against, you know, high major teams. I think about Kentucky. Just Gonzaga's size last year um, became a real advantage. So, you know, let's see what where it ends up this year. I mean, I don't know if you have thoughts on it this, you know, this early already on kind of 
what the identity of this group is going to be. But from my perspective, I, I just don't know. No, I think it evolves. I, I think it might be one thing at the outset and something different at the end, just kind of how last year went. It was bumpy. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good and, point. And they were a lot different at the end of the year than they were at the start. And this is going to be the same thing. I will say it's, it's kind of incumbent on the, on the new guys, the, not the core eight we've talked about, but the Emmanuel, um, uh, is, is Miley and June. God, we haven't even mentioned June. June right. is the talent. I mean, those are the nine, 10, 11 range. And if they bring something different, which defensively, I think a couple of those guys could And June with his size. And I mean, June is a specimen now and, and yeah, he yeah. has some abilities. So, uh, they will have to play their way in and out of the rotation. I think the other eight have some leeway. Uh, let's run through the exhibition games real quick. Uh, first game, the loss to USC. Second half, I believe, was uh, uh, was uh, an NBA All Star game. Defensive optional <laughs> at, at times. Not a lot of stops going on. Uh, but I thought uh, the bottom line was the Zags. Obviously, they can score it. They scored ninety three. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Defense right now is priority number one. They had trouble guarding on the ball. First half, they were losing cutters, and they had trouble with the three-point line. They lost guys on drive and dish and couldn't recover, but mainly the on-ball stuff. And that was not only guards, but that was facing up. USC has a lot of 6'5", 6'6", 6'7", guys who played 100 games and, and had leeway to do it, but... That's what stood out to me was the defensive issues in that game. Obviously, the Zags are going to score it. Can they find five that can hold people down? Yeah, that's the same takeaway I had, Jim. Uh, offense is not going to be a problem. It has been a problem in two decades. <laughs> it's going to be there for for them. But, you know, and they have the depth now. Where you know, I think last year, if if Ryan wasn't making shots, or you know, Graham had an off night, you know, you know or uh, rather Hickman had an off night. They didn't have anybody else on the printer that you might be able to plug in there that could score. Yeah. That's not going to be a problem this year. So I, I just think they're they're going to have no issues putting the ball in the in the basket. But I landed in the same places. You know, you, you can't take too much away from these exhibitions. The rotations are odd. Uh, playing time isn't necessarily what you'd see in a game that actually matters. Um, but it it, it was kind of it was concerning you know for the first time you're playing against somebody else there's a lot of blow buys and that's going to be i think the, the 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 differentiator for this group ultimately from from my perspective is going to be where do they land nationally defensively from a rating perspective and you know i i, I don't know if they've, they've been you know 50 to what 70 75 last you know handful of years or whatever it is since maybe that 2021 team that went that lost to baylor um so last three three or four years or are they going to end up being a top 20 team yeah. that, you know, can find a way to to really get good on that end? And and that's going to be fascinating to see because I do think they have the personnel to be good defensively. You know, they don't have necessarily the traditional shot blocker. Um, but what they do have is they have A, depth, and B, they have guys – like Emmanuel that can guard Dusty's a solid defender. Mm -hmm. You know, Graham's not a guy who's at the rim, but you know, he, you, you can't move him. He, he occupies a lot of space. Ben is super active, you know, but you know, my question, you know, I'm curious to see on the defensive end, how battle and Ajayi do, um, you know, battle is a guy who's very offensive minded is gives them a really unique dynamic and that he can go get his own offense at any point in the game. Uh, in other words, you don't have to rely on the system to get you a shot. If you have a late clock situation or he has a, a mismatch, you know, he you give him the freedom to try to create that offense. That's a real luxury at the college level. That's obviously something you would see at the next level all, every night as a guy who can just go get his own bucket. Um, but is he a guy who will guard, you know, Michael um, at Pepperdine, you know, you want to look at what he did uh, a little bit differently, at least I do, in that, you know, he did not play in the most structured system you and I have ever watched at Pepperdine with that staff. Um, no, but he's, right. obviously, he's obviously got an immense amount of talent, but that's not a program at Pepperdine that prioritized defense for the last decade. 
he's and gonna I, be at, he's gonna be asked to guard this year and yeah. he's got the tools to do it but that's that's not the same thing as being able to do it so you know i'll be interested to see but they've got the the pieces and the personnel to be good on that end of the floor be great on that end of the floor but we obviously didn't see that against usc well and, and the newcomers the first year transfers I'm by now I'm sure they understand that that will be <laughs> that will be demanded of them the guarding and Michael plays very hard so I don't think it's any issue with him I don't think it's an issue with battle it's it's uh, I, I think they have the desire they have to take that to the court and do it every night and they're both very physical strong you know quick all the they, they have all the attributes they can do it and if they do do it, that will really change the complexion defensively because they've got bodies to rotate the bigs through, you know, and and, uh, and eat up fouls and those things you need to do when you're playing top-tier people, which we, we were going to talk a little bit about Warner Pacific, but uh, the score kind of spoke for itself. It was 21 to 19 at one point, and it ended up, I don't know, 50, 60-point spread. That That is the Greg family bull, Ben Greg. Uh, the senior zag forward, Matt Gregg, the old Warner Pacific. Uh, well, he coached women's basketball there. And now he's the AD there. He he uh, was relentless in getting that game scheduled, and he was able to do it. So, congrats to Matt, and congrats to Ben. He, he's he's uh, played with all the Warner Pacific guys for for years and open gym worked out in that gym for years. So, I'm sure that was a special night for those guys. But let's get to the game. People want to know about the opener. No tiptoeing into this season, Foxy. No, no, uh, no North Florida, Utah Tech, Alabama State. You know, for the first time since Kansas in the COVID year, where they kind of put together a, a four-team tournament down in Fort Myers, uh, the Zags are taking on a very, very good opponent, number eight Baylor. This team is completely reloaded. Scott Drew, much like Mark. Uh, his good buddy Mark Few is uh, very adept at keeping key guys, adding key pieces, developing guys he has in his program. And he's got some high-level transfers, Jeremy Roach from Duke, a uh, three-year starter, nor Chad Omier from uh, Miami, 17 of 10 in the ACC. That's pretty good. Uh, Jalen Celestine from Cal, who I think the Zags poked around with, uh, kind of a wing that's a uh, pretty accomplished player out of the Pac-12 last year. They've got a few guys back, Jaden Nunn, who started, Langston Love, who came off the bench, both in that 6'3", six, 6'4", six, guard range. Baylor's always got a bunch of great guards. That's what the Zags ran into in the 2021 championship game. Uh, had trouble with those guys. And then again in Sioux Falls uh, a year or so later in the non-conference game, pros that are are on their way to the pros, and they've got a bunch of them with a freshman, five-star kid that some people think will be in the running for the top overall draft pick in V.J. Edgecombe, 6'5", athletic, right. all those things. Um, this is a, 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 a team that has a lot of newcomers but is old in a way with Roach, with, uh, I think the three transfers have over 330 games at the college level, nearly 270 starts. So if you're thinking this team, this opponent might have trouble piecing it together, older guys like that, you know, with summer, with fall drills, with two scrimmages, they, they can do it in a hurry. What do you think this game boils down to tonight? Well, if, look, I mean, Gonzaga is going to have an advantage inside with just the depth that they that they can roll out there. You know, I, Baylor has athletes around the rim, but certainly they're more guard forward. I mean, they, they will come at Gonzaga on both ends. They're, they will play fast. I mean, there will be just a ton of speed. Uh, that's going to really challenge Gonzaga defensively on the perimeter to keep them in front. Um you know, I'll be interested to see if we see a bit of zone from Gonzaga to keep the ball in front and maybe – see if uh if Baylor can knock down some shots um just to try to protect the paint but you know at the end of the day you gotta you know get into stance and keep a guy in front of you and, and Baylor makes that really difficult they just have not only a lot of depth on the perimeter but they have a lot of a lot of really good players to your point a ton of uh college experience with those three guys coming in and then the VJ kid is a legitimate top five draft pick um 
you know, he, he'd be unlikely to be the best player on the floor, given he's young, but he certainly will be the most talented player on the floor. Um, you know, so it, it, it'll be interesting. I mean, Gonzaga's, too, you know, they've got a lot of experience playing together. That's not something Baylor has. Uh, you're playing at home, you know, out, but, you know, obviously at the arena. But the last time I was at a game there, a big game like this was Kentucky, and it felt ever very much like a, a true home game. I mean, the crowd really stepped up, I would expect. A similar atmosphere tonight and you know it's a great test for gonzaga i mean there's certainly not uh uh you know casually walking into the season i mean <laughs> mark has decided we're not messing around this year we're going to find out right away where we're at um and i like that i i, I like just starting the season that way and and I, I think reading your article you know the bulk of the top 10 in the uh in the country this year are all starting with a cupcake and Baylor <laughs> and Sagan and said, let's try something different. So, now I would expect it to be a bit sloppy first game of the year, some jitters um, that usually lends itself to, to guys who've been in college for a few years, uh, stepping up and settling things down. And I, I, I just, I, I, we haven't talked about, uh, about him much, but I just think the way Nemhart finished last year and his ability to control the, um, what's happening on the floor makes it really difficult to get to, to run away from Gonzaga. So I would expect it to be a good game and um, I'll be interested to see where, where things are with about five minutes left. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it'll come. I think both teams can score it can score it in a hurry can get out and run, finish all those things. They've got go-to guys, you know, the, the Miami transfer for Baylor is a very effective guy inside and, has some stretch to him a little bit. Obviously, E.K., Huff, you know, those guys can can do damage down there as well. But I might boil it down to whoever's defense can hold the other, not in check, but at least hold down that point total. If, if they're soaring into the 80s or 90s again, it's not going to work for either team. Uh, but whoever has the better night defensively probably comes out ahead in that game. Let's hit the Pac-12. The Zags joined the Pac-12, Foxy. Uh, still need a football member uh, to join to make it a, a recognized uh, conference in the 1A level, but uh, it's a pretty pretty solid basketball conference. Uh, it's not the Big 12. Nothing is. That's the best conference in basketball. But it's, uh, it is a step up from the WCC. It has depth as a bunch of teams that, Played in the tournament last year. You know, San Diego State's a regular. Utah State was in there. Boise State's been in there two or three years in a row under Leon Rice. Washington State made it for the first time in a long time. You know, uh, Oregon State was in the Elite Eight, what, three, four years ago in, in Indianapolis. So uh, I think uh, that's a heck of a starting point with uh, when you add the Zags. When you start with Gonzaga and San Diego State, who've kind of ruled the, the West Coast with Arizona and UCLA and Oregon, uh, you've got a heck of a, 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 a start to a solid conference top to bottom. This might be three, two to three bids every year right. uh, with that kind of collection. It's a move I thought the Zags had to make. Financially, it makes sense. Chris Standiford acknowledged as much. They've thrown around a lot of numbers, 8, 10, 12 million for the Zags. We'll see what it ends up being. But I think financially, I think the company they're keeping, the fact that they won't be left behind, so to speak, yeah. a little bit better position for the future, a slam dunk move. You had to do it, right? Yeah, I'm not sure there was a perfect solution out there for Gonzaga, but if if there, this is about as close as I think they were going to find. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I look at what the Pac-12 had been from a basketball perspective the last few years. I think this league is right there, if not superior to what the Pac-12 was producing. So, from a from a basketball perspective, it, it's certainly going to be a significant improvement or a, 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 a jump in competition to what they've had in the WCC. Um, for a long time now, despite how good St. Mary's has been, there just hasn't been the depth of and quality um, in the middle part to the back end of the WCC. It's been very, very top heavy. There's just hasn't been the depth that you're going to have in this new this new Pac-12. And you know, I, I think you're absolutely right that it it, it come it, it came down to both. I think financially, it made a lot of sense 
but when you're trying to think about where college athletics is going, um, and that's, you know, a, it's not a clear picture. I, I think there's a lot of cloud. It's, it's awfully cloudy. Anybody who I think tells you they've got a firm understanding of what college athletics athletics are going to look like in five, let alone 10 years is, is probably blowing some smoke. Uh, <laughs> but I, I this or makes a, like some, well, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but this makes to make this move um and, and i i think it positions it, it improves gonzaga's position moving forward for the next 25 years the league has been awfully good to gonzaga and i know all of the the complaints about being in the wcc and the challenges associated with being in that conference but ultimately you've been to nine straight three sixteens, two national championship games i've had number one recruits in the country, you can get it. You, you, you were able to compete at the highest level within that conference. Yeah. I don't think you, you could feel that you could, I don't think there was a feeling you could sustain it. If you stayed, you, you had to do something different. So I, I, I think it was a good outcome for Gonzaga for sure. Yeah. Well, let's move on to our fearless forecast where we oh, put gosh. ourselves way out on the plank. We did all right last year, didn't we? I, I think we were fine. We, uh, we may be smarter than we look, Foxy, when it comes to this, because we, we've been on that pretty good for years, I think. But yeah, all right. We uh, we put ourselves out there. We we will endure the the uh, comments that we're inevitably going to hear. But we pick their final record. We'll pick if they win the conference, and we will pick how far they go in March Madness. Uh, Foxy, you want to go first, or you want me to uh, toe the line? I, here? I, I can go first. How many games are going? How many games are scheduled to have? Uh, uh, 16 conference. I think, I think it's 31 regular because it's an MTE. I think there's 31 regular season. Okay. Okay. If not, I'm we'll gonna, amend it uh, next week. All right. Let's just, how about we just go losses? Sure. Let's do that. So let's, uh, I'm going to say that they are going to have three losses. Three regular season losses. Okay. WCC win it. Yeah, or, yes, yes, it? they will win. The, they will win the league. And uh, where are they going in March? How deep? Well, in my mind, I, I, I immediately want to say Elite Eight, um, but I'm going to say Final Four. I, I think that bringing back the the continuity that they're going to have, the depth that they have, they don't have any obvious weakness or any, let me rephrase that. The, the, the weaknesses that they have are all weaknesses that I think they can, they can scheme around mm -hmm. and that they can overcome. If this group can dial it in defensively, uh, which I think they've got every ability to do that, you know, they, they, it may take a, a minute. It may take some time for them to really, um, you know, realize what they can be on that end of the floor. But if they can do that, they're going to score with anybody. And if they're a top 20 to 25 defensive team in the country, I think they're, they're in the final four. Well, I think we're of similar minds here. I have them with uh, uh, four regular season losses, one in league three. I mean, they're not conference Baylor. Yeah. It's low. Arizona state. They go to San Diego state. The three games in the Bahamas could be West Virginia, Indiana. UConn. Ranked, and yeah, UConn, no, yeah. Yeah, they could play Arizona in the title game at the Bahamas. That's another top 10 team. You got UConn, you got Kentucky, you got UCLA, who's picked third in the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. I've got, uh, okay, I'm, I'm changing. I'm going, no, I'll say four, I'll, four losses regular season. And I have hey, going, calm down. We don't win anything. I, so it's okay. You, 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 you're putting a lot, a lot of pressure. Of a lot of pressure. I won last year and I gave you all kinds of stuff. <laughs> So I'm going four losses, one in conference. They win the league, and they go to another Final Four. Okay. That's my prediction. All right. I don't know what that makes it thirty-two and five or something. Another thirty-win season. Mm -hmm. uh, they took one year off there, but uh, I'm I'm saying that I'm sticking with it. I will not change, Foxy. That's uh, that that's out there and. We're going to take a lot of flack for it. So there it is. Let's wrap it up. Foxy, always good to be with you. 
you too, every, buddy. Uh, every 40 minutes or so that we spend here, we I can't tell you how much I enjoy it. So let's uh, also credit Christy Burns. She makes this all go and uh, does it every week. We appreciate her very much. We appreciate you all for listening. Again, check us out on spokesman.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, Google. We're out there. Come find us and tune in. Tell your friends. Until next Monday, take care. We'll be back with you in a week.